welcome aboard. It's time for a little cruise with Dora the Boatress. Let's discover the world of boating as we navigate the waters together. And now, here's Dora. Chris, coming to you from Dockside 365. I have the legend from Lake Cumberland, Don Hunter, with Marine Assist with me today. So this is an interview that I've been excited to be able to do. Uh, Don, if you want to introduce yourself and who you are and what your businesses are here on Lake Cumberland, you go right ahead. Okay, sure. Hi, Dora. Uh, Don Hunter, I own uh, Marine Assist here on Lake Cumberland. It's a towboat service. We offer, uh, you know, boat towing and we sell seasonal membership plans to cover free towing if you break down. And uh, we do all kinds of stuff. We raise boats when they sink and we do dive work and we do some dock work and I sell boat trailers and boat lifts. So a little bit of logistics to do with boats. He doesn't Other than fix them. We don't do service work. Other than fix them. So I have had a, uh, my tow package has been with Don for the last few years. And um, although he's never had to tow in my boat before, he has brought me in with my wave runners on quite a few occasions. <laughs> we like to <laughs> yeah. tow, we like to hit the water probably a little bit too early in the season every year. And it never fails that we suck up some wood chips uh, in the wave runners. And it's gotten to be so consistent that I will call Dawn and we'll use one wave runner to, to tow the other wave runner to the nearest uh, boat ramp. And I'll just right, call Don right. and say, hey, I'm at Ono Boat Ramp. Just come and pick me up there. That way you don't have to tow me all the way back. Because we sometimes we'll be 25 miles down the lake. And that's a yep. really long tow at seven miles an hour. <laughs> yep, we've done it a couple of times. <laughs> yes. Um, so I wanted to do this interview with Don because he has a hey, lot. By the way, that does not make you a good customer. No. A good customer <laughs> is one that pays the membership every year and doesn't call doesn't me. Okay. <laughs> Well, I can, I can attest to the fact that you offer very good customer service because I have to, now I've never had to use you for the boats uh, to tow the boat in. Thankfully my boat, I've never had any issues with it, uh, but the wave runners, I can say not as much luck. We, we do use you for the wave runners quite frequently. Right. I think we have three wave runners on the plan. So, um, but the, the stories that you have of the experiences that you have had on Lake Cumberland, how many years have you been doing this on Lake Cumberland? I've been at Lake Cumberland, uh, I think this is going on my seven. Uh, this is my 17th season, I guess, 2006. So whatever that math is, I guess it's actually 18. I've been in business since 2000. So I started uh, in the year 2000 down in Florida, on the, uh, in Venice on the West Coast. And uh, we moved here in 2006. I was uh, insightful enough to move here the year before they pulled the plug on the dam for the repairs. So that was interesting. <laughs> the first year, everybody scattered thinking there was no water in the lake. And here I am trying to start a business. So. All right. Um, I have paused. Hang on. Okay. So for anybody who's watching um, online, you can go onto the YouTube channel if you're not, and you can see the pictures that we're going to be talking about. So Dawn, as we look at these pictures, try to give a really good uh, explanation of everything that we're looking at for anybody who's just listening on the radio station and cannot see. Um, but then you can go back and look at the pictures uh, at a later time and go back and watch the YouTube channel. So I'm going to be doing a screen share right now. Um, so some of these pictures are going to be of Don. He's going to introduce his family to us here, and then we'll go into some of the recoveries that he has done here on the lake. So Don, go ahead. That's an old picture there. That's a, yeah, a very old uh, picture. <laughs> yeah, that's me and my wife. Shortly after we were married, I had a, uh, I had a 21 foot checkmate on the Hudson river. I was born and raised in upstate New York, about 70 miles North of New York city. So this is near Cornwall on the Hudson and West Point. If you know where West Point is on the Hudson River, that's where uh, I grew up. I ran a, a fuel pier there when I was 14 and 15 years old and just been on the water forever. We had sailboats at the time, but that's uh, Suzanne, my wife and me shortly after we got married in that picture. <laughs> uh, this one is uh, here in Kentucky at one of my shops. I was working on one of the tow boats. You see it in the background there, the orange. And I had my two sons. That's Kyle on the floor, the younger boy. And Jason's standing up. He's uh, two years older than Kyle. So they're about they're about a year and a half apart. So uh, I was obviously explaining something very life-changing, very important. <laughs> they seem very intrigued there. Jason I had, has I had all their attention. <laughs> yes, Jason has rescued me once or twice on the water before. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, okay, yeah, me and Suzanne again, the wife. Yeah, that's, uh, I don't remember what that year that was. That was probably in about 2010. Um, and I think Cranky took that picture. One of the, one of our, one of the people from the old forum, uh, we met up with him out in the Jamestown Harbor one day and he snapped that picture and emailed it to me. It was either him or Dave Dyson. I'm not sure which, but one of them sent me that picture. I think that's the last time my wife was on the boat. Oh my goodness. That's, that's a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that picture is from, uh, last season. Uh, Captain Tim went out and drugged that one back into the water. This the, was one of boats. the boats that grounded. That yeah, they they, uh, they were running around at night and the first time on the lake and he had missed the turnoff for Wolf Creek and ended up running up on Ramsey's Point. So he was quite a ways off course and couldn't see where they were going. So he thought he was turning off Wolf Creek and ended up on Ramsey's. That's way off. Yeah, yeah he was way off. He had no clue and it was dark and uh, they didn't get hurt or anything. And he called me that night and I told him what it would cost and they ended up getting the ride back with Water Patrol and then uh, we recovered the boat the next day for him. Uh, that's a pretty famous picture. <laughs> that picture that's has a... made its rounds. This was a people trying to figure out how on earth that that large of a boat got that far up onto the shoreline. So the couple that owned that boat uh, were uh, having dinner at Rowena uh, Marina and uh, left around dusk and headed up the lake. They were state dock uh, customers uh, where their slip was. And they... Uh, he was running up the lake, he says, about 25 miles an hour. Of course, it's a big boat. It's 38, 38 foot and about 20,000 pounds or better, 22,000 pounds. And uh, he, he saw that outcropping of land at the last moment up in Beaver Creek. He just, he had turned, the lake kind of takes a dog leg. And uh, he turned too early and ended up in the mouth of Beaver and Otter Creek and ran into that island. And uh, he said that he said he was watching radar and it had it, it it updated it came around and all of a sudden there was the land and he turned the wheel at the last minute but the big boat just didn't respond so up on the land it went and it just tore the bottom out of that boat just ruined it so when i'm out they on the get, i mean he got beat up a little bit not bad they weren't you know no broken bones or anything but they were bruised up pretty good when i'm out on the water especially at night i, I use navionics is it navionics navionics yeah on your phone yes on the phone app, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Navionics is a good program. I, I, of course, on the towboats, we use a, a true marine GPS unit with mapping in it just because they track more satellites and they tend to be a little bit more accurate than a phone app most of the time, at least in my opinion, you know. So that's kind of that's kind of what we do. But Navionics is good too, you know. Between, you just have to, you have to remember that it's secondary, you know. You got to keep your, you got to keep the lights dim and you got to really watch the uh watch the the uh the shoreline as best you can and then use the uh, app as a uh, secondary reference to verify what you're seeing that's the way we do it you know yes and i always try to tell people and you don't want you don't ever number one you don't ever want to combine alcohol with driving and you especially don't want to combine alcohol at night with driving um and here's the boat as it came out of the water once it came out of the oh, water yeah. yeah that's down in the parking lot at jamestown marina after i pulled it up the hill and got it on the trailer and there's where's the there's a video of this online. Is that on your YouTube channel or on your Facebook page? Yeah, I've got a whole uh, I've got a whole uh, YouTube video of that entire process that I edited down shows it from start to finish and even loading it on the uh, trailer going to Copart because it was a total loss. So Copart uh, sent a a, a twenty ton uh, rotator truck to put it on a transport trailer and get it off my lot. Yep. But even the ingenuity that you guys used to to get that from land back into the water like how you guys had to do that was I to me was pretty impressive I mean I guess it's probably second hand nature to you guys on how to figure out how to get because that boat was really far and there's going to be a picture here in a few minutes that's going to show a boat that just ran way up on you know probably a good 20 yards up into the uh on the shoreline but something that large and you know who knows how much gas it had. was there any fuel spillage with that boat that went into the no, water. No, it didn't have any of that happen. It, it broke a bunch of stuff inside. It broke the water tank loose and it broke the thruster loose. And one of the engines came loose and broke and fell down in the bilge, but there was not any fluid spilled. Um, the, uh, it was, uh, it really tore that boat up really well. And of course, when you're on land like that, that boat has inboard engines. So the propellers and the rudders and struts are all sticking down and, and it stuck in the craggly rocks there. I had to climb under it and we cut all that off flush with the bottom because it just all it is is provides drag when you're trying to get it back in the water. 
And of course, you can't pull that boat backwards to get it back in the water. I have to turn it around. You have to bring the light into the water first. You try to pull it backwards and the transom just digs into the rocks and, you know, it's like digging your heels and not wanting to go anywhere. That's what that boat would do if you tried to pull it backwards. So we had to first turn it around and then we put it on rollers and uh, pulled it on rollers back into the uh, back into the lake. And after we had patched the bottom, so we patched the entire bottom with sheet metal and some spray foam to keep it afloat to get it back to the marina. And uh, I did, couldn't rip the patches off, so we built a cradle and then we rolled the cradle on rollers into the water. It was pretty. Uh, it was all. It was pretty, awesome. <laughs> It was two days worth of work, you know? Yeah, it, it was really, like like I said, you guys, you can go to his Facebook page, um, but there's in the YouTube channel, I think you're the Marine Assist YouTube channel, you have the videos of that that are on there. And it is, it's pretty impressive to watch this particular video of this boat, of how you guys got it from land back into the water and then back up onto the trailer. I learned early on when I moved here that I was kind of all by myself doing this type of work. There's nobody to fall back on. Like when I did this recovery type work in Florida, you could, there was always a barge and a crane down the, down the waterway a little doing dock work or something. You could always hire somebody to come along and help, you know, here I'm very much dependent on myself to do whatever happens. So you can't call a crane and a barge. There just isn't one here. There isn't uh, there isn't any kind of access to the shoreline to get any type of machinery. Uh, you know, you're pretty much stuck to what you can do here. So yeah. Uh, that was pretty evident early on, and it it caused me to have to buy a lot of equipment to be able to recover anything that we find here. All right, let's see. Okay, this one. Yeah, that's another one from last season. That's a uh, that's a thirty foot Baja. Uh, he had hit a log up in uh, up in the river up in Burnside that he didn't see, and it cleared one of the outdrives right off the back of the boat, and it pretty much sank within a few minutes' time. Uh, he called me, we responded, we got to him within about, uh, but within about a half an hour, and uh, that was Captain John. He actually towed him to the Burnside Island ramp and uh, pulled it, put it alongside the ramp, and then we raised it from there and got it out of the water for him. There it is, raised. Uh, that's one of the boats that had caught fire at Beaver Creek Marina this past summer. There was three boats. This was the least damaged one. Um, How long was that houseboat? They, those were all 78 footers. They were sister boats. They were all the same brand and everything. Um, they were all 78 feet long to start with. Uh, that was, uh, so that's the one that was actually upwind. There was a little breeze that night. The, the boat that started the fire burned the boat on either side of it. And this was the one that was upwind. So it had a little bit of a cabin left. Because Did they ever determine what flame. started it? No, um, the fellow was staying on the boat on the opposite side of this that night. He woke up, the dog woke him up and uh, to see in flames. And uh, he said that the back end was on fire, but there wasn't an explosion or anything. It was probably some electrical, probably a battery charger or something stupid like that, you know. It was so far burned that even the fire investigator wow. kind of threw his hands up, you know. Yeah, there's yeah, that's the least left of that boat. No, that's the least damaged one of the three. So, yeah, you can almost in this picture, you guys, you can almost see clear through it. I mean, like there's, there's not, you say you're looking through the window. There's not, I mean, like the whole thing is pretty much gone. Wow. Right. And that's on, that's on Jack Henderson's trailer going up the hill. That's what that is. Uh, these were some folks that uh, managed to leave the ramp at the dam without the plug in the boat and got across the way over by Indian Creek little old couple, nice folks, you know, and uh, he had just gotten out of the hospital for a leg operation and was kind of out of sorts and I forgot to put the plug in, got over there and this is the scene. So they called and we came out and got the boat raised and got him back on his trailer, took him back. You know, we had somebody at um, Lake Cumberland Marina last year that was going around and removing the plugs off of boats that were up on lifts. Did you hear about that? No, I didn't. Yeah, sure did. Lake Cumberland Marina. And uh, it was the boats, obviously the boats that were up on the lifts because they could, it was accessible. Um, our wave runner that was on the lift, the plugs got removed from it. They unscrewed them three different times. Um, the first time we didn't know that it had happened and my daughter called and, you know, I have a 14 year old kid running around on a wave runner and she calls and says, I think something's wrong with the wave runner. I said, take it over to the Wolf Creek, get it up on the lift and let Scott look at it. Sure enough, as soon as she got it up on the lift, water just pouring out the back of it, you know, and I'm like, I know I put 
the, I know I put the plugs in it when I put, when I launched it. And so I just thought, well, maybe I had a brain fart and I didn't. Well, the next week, same thing. I'm like, okay, week three, we're checking it before you take it off of our lift. Cause we have a lift for it at, at the Marina. And sure enough, when we looked at the back of it for the third week in a row, somebody had pulled the plugs on it. And You're so the it, oh, yeah. surely you put the plug in it. It, it, absolutely. And so at that point, you know, like the first time I was like, okay, maybe I didn't. I mean, sure. I know when I launched my wave runners, we do this constantly. I would put the plug in, but people have obviously, I mean, this guy right here, he launched this boat. He's probably been boating his entire life. And every once in a while, people make mistakes. You, you have a brain fart, you do something he was, like this. He was out of sorts that day, you know, and they the just wanted mistake. to go out for a ride and see if they could catch a fish or two, you know, she was a long time employee of one of the marinas, uh, so, she, uh, you know, and she's like, you know, I kind of had my thoughts. Maybe we shouldn't go. And you know, it was one of those deals. But uh, but we got them straightened out, got them back. Uh, that was uh, first, that was Memorial Day last uh, summer. These uh, This fellow was riding along in his boat over. He was coming out of the launch ramp at Burnside Island. And a cruiser had gone by and... For some reason, when he got to the first uh, wave, he decided to throttle up and submarine through the second one. So, and it filled the boat with water and sank it right there. Wow. Just a little bit of operator error on that one. Well, that's a beautiful uh, Yeah, Captain John at sunset one night, he had just dropped off some folks over. I think that was at Woodson Bend, maybe. He had dropped some people off and she snapped a photo for me and sent it to me. I have customers send me pictures of our doing stuff all the time. So I've got a pretty big repertoire of stuff. That's an old picture, 2007, I think that says. So that's, uh, and a lot of people will recognize that one. This was during uh, the night of Poker Run 2007, There's if I remember two right. boats on the shoreline. There's actually three. Uh, the other one's just out of frame. So interesting story behind this one there. I don't know if you can see there, but on the crest, there's a tent. There was yes. there were some people camping on the point there at Ramsey's Point, and they had a light in the tent outside the tent on a pole, like a camp camp light, you know. Uh -huh. These three boats were following each other. They had left state dock, the state dock party heading for Conley that night. And this fella in the first boat uh mistook the light for a stern light of another boat, thought he was following another boat. Oh no. But all three of them following each other all ran on land. Uh, because of so after that the guy doused his light after three boats had <laughs> on land. So yeah. this was the scene the next morning, you know. Uh, and the the fellow with the Baja there, he he owned a construction company. He brought down a couple of bobcats to try to clear the path to get the boat back in the water, and he got in big trouble for that. The crew were finding big time for disturbing dirt on the on the property. You're not allowed to do that, you know. I bet. Yeah. So all three of those did. I guess you would. As far as as far up on the shoreline as those boats are, I guess you would have used the same method as what you did for the other one. Did you have to turn those around as well when you pulled them off so, the shoreline? I didn't recover the Baja. The customer did that. The guy with the Bobcat did that himself. I did the third one, which is just out of frame. I, I think I did the second one too, if I remember right, so long ago. But yeah, I mean, basically, and, and people kind of wince when I tell them about stuff, you know, and how we're going to do it and this and that. And they're like, just pull it backwards. It's less dangerous. I said, look, you have already damaged the bottom of the boat. You run it up on rocks. I said, you, you're, you have done way more damage than I will ever do getting that thing back to the lake, you know? So typically we pull the bow around uh, and back into the water because the boat's designed to go forward. It's not designed to go backwards, you know? I mean, hell, even in the water trying to back them up, they don't want to go very well. Yeah, and you know? and in, in these cases, these are not toes. These are salvages, I would think, in most cases. Yeah, yeah. I mean, technically, even a tow is salvage. It's just light order salvage. You know, if you're if the boat is disabled in a drift, it's subject to wind and waves and current, and it could become a wreck at some point. So, therefore, it's salvage. It's just low order salvage. And we just classify all that stuff as by the hour rather than by the value of the boat or a percentage or something like that. These are more uh, true salvage because, I mean, they're totally out of the water, possibly hold the boat, done mechanical damage to it. There's no doubt that it's a salvage job, you know, so they get, char they get uh, uh, charged basically by a percentage of the boat or by a per foot charge plus the tow. You know, it's just 
it depends on what we get involved in in the job how we how we negotiate them around but uh um, you know it's it's not terrible it's it's you know i mean to get that middle boat back in the water that probably was a two thousand dollar job maybe something like that you know but it would have taken at least one tow and a couple to crew and you know, then you got to tow it to the marina whatever time that takes you know and that's it was it's not leaking right oh that's a fire that's what's left of a uh of a boat that caught fire over near waitsboro it's a single engine boat isn't it Dora? no do Oh, is it twins? Yeah. Okay. So that was a that was a twenty eight foot power quest that a uh, guy was out test driving in one October in Fishing Creek, the only boat on the lake, and uh, he uh, it had a fuel leak, caught the boat on fire. He had to swim to shore, and he climbed up the cliff to the house there across from Needle Point. That's got a big white vinyl fence around it up there, uh, and he climbed up there to get help. And uh, at the time, the Jamestown fire boat was a fairly new thing. So uh, Pulaski County called Jamestown to see if they'd run the firewood down there to put it out. But, you know, the boat had already burned so far at that point that we didn't bother taking the fireboat down there. I mean, it took him 45 minutes just to get up the hill to the house, you know. In the meantime, the boat's burning. And you see, it, it burned down to the waterline like that and then sank. So yeah. I had to find it and then recover it. So that boat actually sank. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, they burned for a long time because as the material burns out of the top of it, like the cabin burns off and all that, the boat actually gets lighter. So it actually comes up in the water. So it doesn't sink right away. You'd think that it would burn down and you'd have a hole in the boat and sink, but the boat actually comes up four or five inches in the water as the weight burns off of it, you know? So they, they, tend, to, they tend to float quite a while on fire. And then eventually a hose will burn through back at the engine and that pretty much does the demise, you know? But uh, but sure enough, that one sank back there and we recovered it right there and uh, right off the point of that guy's house. Can't think of his name, but uh, he's got a nice Wow, house that is there. way up there. This this is a boat, you guys, in this picture. It looks like a bass boat. And it is, how far up on the shoreline is that boat? It, I'm So I'm, I took that picture from on the deck of the towboat, pulled up to the bank. This was when uh, the lake was drawn down. So this would have been about 2008 or so. Um, so... That was, uh, that's that island in the mouth of Beaver and Otter that, uh, it's not Cemetery Island, it's the other one. I, I don't know, I've seen it on Google, it's Heart Island. But As you say, it's shaped like a heart from over time. Yeah, 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 he ran up on that. He was running pretty good, and of course, bass boats are light, you know, and um, that was a long ways, but it, it, it was didn't at nighttime. really hurt. I mean, it scratches the bottom up, but it didn't really terribly tear him up, you know? I mean, it's crazy. You'd think that it would do a lot more damage. Than it does, but I towed that all the way back to Jamestown without it leaking a drop of water and put it on a trailer for him. Wow. <laughs> so I gave you this picture. I don't know if you remember on the old LakeCumberland.com boaters forum, uh, there was the beached houseboat thread, and it went on for years. People would bring it up now and then, and uh, this houseboat had been put on the bank, backed by 76 Falls. And the owner lived at the top of the hill and he left it there one winter rather than paying slip fees at the marina. And when the lake went down, the boat was on the bank all winter and somebody took a picture of it and it went, I forget how many pages on that forum it took up. It went, I think a hundred and some odd pages and everybody commented on it and everybody talked about it. It was this big, you know, this whole thing. When the water came back up in the spring, of course, you know, the boat's at such an angle that it fills with water and sinks basically on the shore without even getting a chance to float, you know, as the water comes back up. And uh, the owner pretty much abandoned it. And it was about three years that it kind of sat around. And uh, I finally got tired of hearing about it. So uh, I went and recovered it. It's one of the ones that I've done for free over the years just to get rid of the stuff off the lake. <laughs> but that's the condition it was in after it had been sunk two or three times and uh, the cabin was falling off of it, and it was a mess. Uh, but Jack Henderson and I uh, kind of uh, took it upon ourselves to get it out and get rid of it for the just for the good of the lake, really. I've, I've done a dozen or two over the years that we've recovered and gotten rid of just for the heck of it, you know. <laughs> there was one you and I spoke about um, this past season uh, that uh, they were concerned about. There was a fishing tournament that was coming in town. And there was, I believe it was a small, was it a small houseboat, uh, right? The mouth yeah. of Beaver, was it Beaver Creek? 
and they were afraid people were going to hit it. It's way up in Beaver Creek somewhere. Yeah. Uh, I heard you mention me about that one other time. I have not recovered that boat. I don't know if it's still there or not. Um, somebody, I think, tried to recover it and drug it out in the, in the channel where people were running into it. It was up against the bank, you know. But I'm not sure if it's still there or not. I haven't heard it. I haven't been over there yet this year to see if it's still there. The uh, the core was trying to make the owner uh, responsible for it, but I haven't heard any more updates on that one yet. So I'm not sure if he got it out or if it's still there. Wow. Okay. Well, um, I knew that somebody you I had talked to you about. You know, how does that work? If you know, can we start a GoFundMe page for you to be able to do that? And you know, you're like, please don't. <laughs> There's laws, <laughs> regulations, there's lots of things. It's not as easy as that. Um, and then like three weeks later, I saw where somebody had started a GoFund page for, for you to do that. And then it kind of fizzled out. And I thought, um, I think Don's probably just waiting for some instruction from the core to decide what to do with that. And then eventually he'll move on it. Well, it's kind of funny because when you when you buy a boat and you title it in your name, you own it, cradle to grave. You know, it's, it's your baby until it comes out of your name. So when you... A lot of people think that when something's abandoned in by marine law, you just go recover it and it's yours. And it doesn't really work that way, you know. I mean, if I go out there and start recovering this guy's boat, uh, he could he could sue me for damaging it. He could sue me, you know. I and mean, there's all kinds of right. ridiculousness that can go on. And once I touch it, I'm kind of responsible for it, you know, from that point forward. So if I tried to recover it and then left it, and then somebody hits it, it kind of puts me in a precarious situation when I wasn't even authorized to work on it to begin with. And there wasn't any, there's no value to it. It's not like you can recover it and sell anything off of it to even pay yourself back for your expenses. You know, I mean, if, if I was to recover that boat without the permission of him and we were successful and got rid of it, I then have to decide to take it to the dump or is this guy going to say, Hey, what'd you do with my boat? I want it. You know, we kind of ran into that with that uh, one at Grider Hill. Um, as soon as I posted the one in Grider Hill in the fall that I, or, uh, yeah, in the fall that I raised that marionette, the owner contacted the marina after two years and said, "Hey, what'd you do to my boat?" You know, he had abandoned it for two years, and then all of a sudden he comes back because he saw me post on Facebook that I had raised it from being sunk, and he called the marina all screaming at him saying they had sunk his boat. Yeah, they <laughs> should have said, "I think Don Hunter has a bill for you. You might want to reach out yeah, to him." Yeah, they did. <laughs> they did. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's see this next one. Uh, okay, so I had a call for a boat that sank in 80-some feet of water out in the mouth of Beaver Creek on the main lake. And it was a 28-foot Donzi, and the fellow said, uh, he was really pretty sharp, that guy. He he was coming out of the mouth of Beaver Creek running, you know, full throttle, and somehow the uh, drive shaft went bad. And before he got the engine shut down, it had wallowed around and made the hole so big in the transom that the boat sank in about two minutes. So he was able to get a life jacket on, get in the water. And then he looked at the shoreline and noticed two points that made a triangle to where the boat was. And he was able to explain to me what those two points were. So I went out and got within the area and turned this old sonar unit on that I had. And it picked up that what you see, that red point sticking straight up. And you see that's that's 80, 81 feet of water. And if you look at the top of that point and align it with the graph on the side, you'll see it's almost 28, 25 feet difference from the bottom up. So typically when boats sink, the heavy end goes down, the propellers stick in the mud, the light end stays sticking up a lot of times and uh, because of air pockets in it or whatever. So they show up on graphs like this. So that's a 28 foot boat sunk in the bottom and 80 feet of water. So I was able to find it on the graph and we marked it. I put a diver down on it. We brought it up with an airbag and then we towed it to shore to raise it the rest of the way. So that, that's the boat. That's it after it came up. Yep. Wow. And you said it took only about two minutes for it to sink. Yeah, he was. Uh, he, yeah, it was quick because the hole was so big, you know, and we had a heck of a time pumping it out to get it because of the same thing. And the hole was so big in the back from that drive shaft damage that we, uh, it took a whole bath towel to stick in it to get it slowed down to where we get bumped with. Oh, that's a houseboat. Yeah, I was wondering if you could tell. That's what I'm trying to turn my head. Trying to, that is a houseboat. Is that is that the bow of a houseboat? It's a fiberglass, like a Gibson houseboat. Yeah. Like, four, like 40 foot, right? So Grider Hill calls me one day and said, we had a houseboat sink. Come down and get it out for us. I said, okay. So I go down there. 
and I'm expecting this is now this is like a hundred and Grider Hills deep. That's like that's like 140 feet of water in that mm -hmm. picture under that dock. I'm standing on the dock looking down, taking that picture. That boat is free floating, just like that. No ropes on it. And I thought, how the heck is it? It should be on the bottom, you know? Were you just like waiting so we, for a big bubble to go bloop, and then it just <laughs> sink? <laughs> I'd never seen anything like it. So I, I put the divers in the water and we put some airbags on it, rig it and bring it up. And what I had found is that the, the owner of the boat had been refurbishing the boat and he had it full of about 70 two by fours. And the two by fours provide enough flotation to keep the boat oh, afloat. <laughs> yeah. They hadn't gotten waterlogged yet. So we got there quick enough that we were able to keep it from going to the bottom because of the buoyancy of the wood in it. It was the darndest thing I've ever seen. Yeah. You never expect lumber to be what keeps you afloat. No. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. So it looks like that when we raised it. You can see wow. it replaced part of the front deck already, you know? Yeah, man, that's a really nice boat too. I love the older, I love the older house boats, especially the Gibsons. I just, I, I love those boats. Yeah. <laughs> I think they're amazing boats. We've got one over here at Lake Humboldt Marina. Um, my friend Mark, that he has completely redone him and his dad. And it's a beautiful boat. So I, I, I'm kind of partial to those. What did he end up doing? I mean, was it? salvageable or was it a, a total loss i had henderson pick that one up i don't think they went any further with it you know the problem is when they sink you end up having to do everything you know even if, it, everything. even if it ran before now you've got you've got issues and if there's good hot uh charged up batteries in it it does a lot of damage to all the electric stuff in it as the battery drains out of the batteries you know it ends up ruining all the electric motors and just it makes a mess it can you know well, that's not a boat. <laughs> no. No. So uh, State Dock a few years ago, there was a uh, there was a lady that had parked uh, on the hill, um, I don't know, facing the sh the back of the ship store. OK, when she got in the uh, when she got in the vehicle, she uh, mistook the brake for the gas and drove over the bumper down the hill into the lake. And she managed to get out before the car sank. But the car sank directly under the ship store. So <laughs> we sent divers down and brought the car back up and uh, recovered it for the insurance company. I'm it's like diving to, in a... I'm trying like to place... A, yeah, I'm trying to place how that got under the ship store. <laughs> well, you know, they float for a little while. Yeah. And of course, the momentum was such that it was moving away from the shoreline. So yeah. by the time it's, it took on water and sank, it ends up under the ship store. And that's like diving in a war zone under the ship store. There. Yeah, yes. No. But there's a whole old piece of the original state dock down there with a rowboat still tied to it. Wow. <laughs> so, you know, I wish the water was a little clearer so that you could actually take pictures down there and we could see what you guys see. But I know Lake Cumberland, once you get down, what, 15 feet, you really can't see hardly anything. Yeah, and that's on a good day. In the summertime, in the late summer when it quits raining and the lake really clears up a lot, you might get 15 feet, something like that. If you get down below the thermocline, it's not bad. You should look at some of the videos on my YouTube page. Um, I've got some underwater vi uh, video footage there that we've taken that Luke took for me, one of my divers. Can you make that out? So, well, so I'm looking at, there's a boat up on the sideways, <laughs> up on the shoreline. Is it tilted yeah, on its port side? Boat. The it's basketball a basketball on its port side. How on earth did that happen? I, again, I, I sent you these pictures because they're all kind of novelty, you know? Um, yeah. This was just around the corner oh, wait, from Beaver Creek saved Marina. The cooler. <laughs> <laughs> so these guys were out fishing late at night. Three of them were in that boat. They came around Buffalo Ridge up in uh, Beaver Creek, heading back towards Beaver Creek Marina. And they were too close to the right-hand bank. And I guess they weren't going very fast, but he drove the boat up onto the bank and it tilted over onto the left side and dumped all three of them in the lake and the boat stopped right there. That's how it stopped. There's another view of it here. If you go another one. Were they okay? Yeah, they were fine. You, you, if you're not watching this uh, on the YouTube channel, you really need to go watch the video because this is a very impressed. You couldn't do this again if you tried. Like, I mean, this is, this is, I mean, if you're going to wreck a boat, this is impressive. <laughs> yeah. 
And of course, we had to patch the hole in the bottom of it uh, yeah. before we could even, you know, before we could do anything else with it. It had a pretty good sized hole in the bottom. I mean, I, I, I kind of, if these guys were okay and there was no injuries, I hope they have a picture of this framed up on their wall it, with any fish <laughs> that they might have mounted on the wall, because th this is, I mean, this is pretty impressive. <laughs> yep. It's stopped just like that. I mean, you can see the ledge. I mean, it drops right yeah. off the 50 feet of water just outside of it. Yeah. That's, that's pretty wild. Okay. So there was a big windstorm at state dock a few years ago and that's a, that's a roof off of one of yeah. the larger houseboats that roof is probably 20 feet wide by 80 feet long maybe uh it had the flybridge on and everything there was enough wind there that it picked that roof up and tossed it off the boat and jammed it between him and his neighbor uh which was dolphin john uh john's not with us anymore uh, but it wedged between uh, his boat, the Dolphin, and uh, this fellow's boat, and we, and we had to recover it. Um, when I pulled it back and got airbags on it, turns out I didn't need airbags. It floated on its own because, you know, the houseboat roofs are wood structured, mm -hmm. covered with fiberglass. So uh, I towed it over to the ramp and put it on one of my big houseboat trailers to dispose of it. So what was left of the houseboat was just a houseboat with an open, at that point, just no roof, just an open... Well, this was like an upper roof, kind of like like a second it story. Yeah, it was. Okay. It was a second story, but it was not closed in all the way around it. Gotcha. Does that make sense? Yes. Yep. Uh, so it, you know, like when they transport houseboats, they're one level. That's what the boat ended up looking like after this okay. came off. That makes sense. Wow. Uh, okay, a few years ago, the, the this blue this large blue boat had gone out for sunset cruise the guy was test driving it to decide if he wanted to buy it or not and uh he and the wife had gone up the lake and about near the mouth of beaver and otter creek at dusk all of a sudden the boat that you see in the frame to the right there just came made a, a right hand turn and came across the lake and ran right directly into him the driver in the in the small boat was uh, big time BUI. I forget what the number he blew was, but it was a huge number. The other boat was just crawling along and didn't have the ability to make any kind of turns or abrupt maneuvers because it didn't have any way on, you know? Um, yeah. And they were lodged. When I actually arrived on scene, uh, the boats were still stuck together. They were still lodged together. I thought the bigger one might sink because the smaller one had to push down to where that hole was in the water and was actually taking on water in the and the pumps were running. And then a cruiser went by and the waves uh, separated, caused them to come apart. And, uh, but that was a mess there. And the, the guy that owns the bigger boat was kind of a friend of mine. And he said, thank God our kids weren't with us because our kids would have been sitting down there at the table playing games, you know, <laughs> when yeah. that happened. It's, uh, it, I, I encourage, you know, here at the, here at the campground, you know, we, we have 46 sites and I encourage, they're all boaters. Everybody here is a boater. And I watch, like, I, 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 talk, to be, I talk to mother, everybody. I'm 42 years old. Most of my customers are older than I am that are here. And so I try not to mother them. But when it starts to get dark, I start to get worried about my customers that are not back. When I go to the back lot and I start counting boats and I know which ones are not back yet, especially if any of them are drinkers, I start to get a little bit concerned. I'll shoot them a text message like, hey, you guys okay? If, especially if they didn't submit a float plan. Like I, I try to, you know how I am. I teach people how to boat. Um, I, I try to teach them to boat responsibly. I tell them, if you go to a restaurant at night and you have too much to drink, call me. My husband will drive me to the marina. I will drive your boat back here and I will get you back safely to the campground. I would read, I don't care if it's one o'clock in the morning there, there, I can drive any boat that's out here on Lake Cumberland. You call me, I'll come on land and I'll drive your boat back. Please do not do anything irresponsible. That being said, I myself am on the water a lot. I don't drink. And especially if I'm driving this past um, this past summer, we do a lot of uh, shoreline campfires. We love to go out at, at nighttime and we'll take a big group with us. I mean, I'll have my tritoon completely to max capacity, you know, 13, 15 people on it. Mm -hmm. And we'll go out, we go through low gap right there on the other side on the main body. And we'll go right there on that big flat where it comes out and um, we'll have a big campfire. 
three times this year, when we were coming back between 11 and 1 30 in the morning, there was a boat coming out of state dock and it was like trying to dodge, not knowing which they were, which way they were coming and they, their lights, they didn't have their lights on the right. You know, they had like the big, what are they called? The, the ambiance lights, the, the blue lights. Oh on. Yeah. 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 And and that's like your first big red flag, either inexperienced boater or drunk. And one of them missed the front of our boat by like 10 feet. We had friends that were following us behind, scared them half to death, you know, and, and I could see my path because I'm tracking myself on the Navionics, watching the shorelines, tracking my way back in that I came out. I couldn't go any closer or I would have hit the shoreline. You know, these things happen all the time. When you combine alcohol and, and boats, this is a result. It, it is so well, unsafe. The nighttime operation keeps getting worse, too, because they keep doing more and more lighting inside the cockpits of boats, you know, and that stuff is meant for when you're at the dock. You know, I don't understand how people don't I, I guess people just don't grasp that night vision is something that gets better with less lighting, you know, and as soon as you start turning on all the courtesy lights, you've just killed it. I mean, we throw a towel or anything over the gauges on the towboats. So that we don't have that issue, you know, and then next thing you know, you run upon somebody that's run up the lake with uh, LEDs on. <laughs> yep. It just kills your night vision, you know, I mean, you, it, and the headlight deal is even worse yet. The bass boats with the headlights running yep. or any of them with the headlights on. I mean, that light hits the water and reflects. You don't know where it's going to reflect to. And you and can't tell what direction kills. they're. you can't tell if they're coming or going, which direction they're going. It's because it's blinding. I have a um, my tritune has the like just my own lights that face me are so blinding and so bright. I have a, I have a dark purple blanket, one of those real thick sweatshirt blankets yeah. that I just drape over the steering wheel over everything so that I'm not blinded when I drive my own boat. Um, yeah. and I, it, it drives me bonkers people that are out there um, and they're not respectful of other people on the water. I just, it's one of the big things I preach I, like on my soapbox, the soapbox that I preach about responsible boating. Um, and I, and I talk about it in my classes all the time uh, for people just to please be courteous of other people that are out there and be a responsible boater. Wow. Yeah. Here's a picture you guys. This is once that boat was pulled out of the water, um, the, where it collided. Yeah, you can actually the see the V from the other, the V shape yeah. from the other boat. Yeah. You it, can see the, where the V hole, where it literally just went straight into the side of this boat. And that guy was right. If his kids had been in that boat, it is right where they would have been. Yep. Yeah. Uh, another picture of the Beaver Creek fire this this uh, summer. I think that's the same boat. Uh, so this is when I arrived on scene. That boat that you just saw, that's it, how it was laying. It was laying sideways like that in the water, sitting on the underwater bracing from the dock. These fingers, these dock fingers, are all pulled together because there's another boat sitting on it. And then the third boat sank and fell on top of the second boat. So there's three boats in that picture. You just only see one. <laughs> so you cover you recovered all three of the boats that were there at, at Beaver this past yeah. year when they sunk. Yeah, we did all three. Yeah. Yep. But you pretty much had to do all three of them because everything was intertwined. Yeah. You know, we even we even had to cut some of the dock away to get the boats out. So it was a it was a pretty good mess. My friends who were in Tennessee this this uh, just a few months ago when the snow came down on the top of the marina and the the roof collapsed on top of their boat, um, and I was talking to you about that, texting back and forth, um, that ended up costing the two, it was their houseboat, and then they had the slip next to it where, they're, where they kept their runabout and their wave runners, and then next to that was another houseboat, or another houseboat, so those three slips, and just that part was $1.6 million worth of recovery yeah. is what it costs. Yeah, it adds up. It adds up quickly. Uh, okay, that's that big uh, regal once we'd gotten it back into the water. I was just- That's the one that's on the YouTube thing. video that you were talking about. You had to spin around and drag off. Right, right. Yeah. That's, uh, that's one of the pictures showing how intertwined all the propeller and the rudder was in the rocks when it was on the shoreline. Zoom in on it. Wow. So that's what the shoreline actually looks like up close that you're having to work on, work with. <laughs> and you were crawling up underneath there. <laughs> yeah, I had to get up. A bit. We cut the rudders off and I cut the uh, propeller shafts off you know, to get the props off because it was all destroyed anyway. This uh, is the one I was talking about that was so far up onto the shoreline. 
So this was up, uh, this is up in your neck of the woods. This is up by Alligator One over across by that ramp across the way. Yep. He had, uh, he had oh, gone in there and made a, he had gone in there and made a big circle to come back out uh, and uh, kind of made too big a circle, too wide. <laughs> that was at night. It, it happened at night. Uh, I sent you this picture just to show that we, every now and then we get involved with the Coast Guard when they have new cadets they bring down on the lake. We help them when they're doing uh, towing training and things like that. We uh, we let them hook up and tow us around. And, uh, you know, so every now and then we get involved with the Coast Guard when they're down there. They only come down once or twice a year, at least historically. They may come more now. I don't know. But uh, we try to we try to abide and help them whenever we can. Yeah, I, I have had this past year when I, I was working for Suntex, when I was uh, driving the water taxi for them for um, uh, for state doc for the poker run. And uh, that night I got pulled over two times, even yeah. though I was driving the water taxi. And I know they were doing some training exercises and things. But after the second time, I was like, it's me, guys. <laughs> they, yeah. they, they let me go that time. Um, but yeah, these pictures are great, Don. I appreciate you sharing these with me. This is a houseboat being towed. Yeah, that's just a picture of us towing a houseboat. Um, and that's an example of me towing somebody into the dock on the hip so I can control the boat better. We don't tow them on a long line around the marina. I can back them onto a, into a slip or uh, put them onto a trailer from that position pretty easily. I towed some friends in, which I do not do very often. I tell everybody. Um, so when it comes to... Back in the day when I was a kid, when coming down to Lake Cumberland, if you saw somebody and they were broke down, it was common courtesy that you stopped and you brought them in. I mean, my parents did it. It was just, it was the common courtesy of what you did. It was boater courtesy. And I explained to my customers up here on the countertop, I have a container with your, with Marine Assist. And anytime I have a customer come in, I give them the pamphlet and say, make sure you get your Marine Assist membership. And some of them will look at me and say, well, I have friends out there that, you know, they'll just give me a toe in. And I, my response, I always tell them, I say, you know, back in the day, that was what we did. You know, our friends towed us in. But you have to realize now that it's $95 and we work all week long to come and spend technically one full day on the water. And if your friends have to tow you in on their one day on the water, that makes you the asshole. <laughs> so spend the $95 and then make the phone call for them for Don to come and pick them up. That way your friends can enjoy the rest of the day on the water. Because if you can't afford a $95 boat membership to cover you for the whole entire year, then you probably shouldn't be out there on the water in a boat spending money on the water. And, you know, it is now the common courtesy is to buy the membership so that you don't inconvenience your friends and ask them to tow you in. Nobody wants to do that. And so well, that's kind of, I try to stress that to all of my customers and all of my friends by the membership. But, and you run into the fact that a recreational boat isn't meant to tow another boat anyway. And your insurance policy won't cover you if anything goes wrong. If you're towing another boat, it specifically excludes it, you know? So you got all kinds of issues going on there. Um, I've picked up tows from people where they had accepted a tow from a good Samaritan and the good Samaritan ended up being a little drunker than they wanted to be tied to. I've had people scared to death and they cut the rope and called me and said, Hey, come get me because this guy was towing me. At, he was trying to tow me at 20 some miles an hour and we, yeah. we stuffed the wave over the front, you know? So we had to cut the rope to get him to leave us. <laughs> so I've heard all kinds of stories over the years, you know, and, well, and you know, I, when I went to, when I went to school and got my merchant mariner passport, I did the tow class. And then, you know, I, I speak very highly of Carl. I love Carl to death, you know, and I've watched him out on the water and, and, um, some friends of mine this past year, they had a last season, they had a really rough time with their boat and then they got rid of it. They got a new boat. Their first time out on the water, it broke down new boat. It broke down. I'm like, you guys are cursed. And so I did tow them in and I pulled them behind me. And then once I got close to the no wake zone, just on the other side of it, I stopped. And I remember he was like, what are you doing? I was like, I'm going to pull you up next to me. And they were like, well, why? And I said, I just kind of thought, what do you mean? Why? Like to me, I thought, because I'm not going to pull you through this Marina 
20 feet behind me where I have no control of you. I'm going to pull you up next to me where I have complete control of you. And I'm literally going to pull you right up to the dock up by the boat ramp. And he just looked at me and he goes, oh, I never thought of that. He goes, the last time somebody towed us in, they came in too fast and our boat ended up hitting the engine on the back of their tritune. Yeah. And, I, and that's why you don't let people tow you who don't know what they're doing and you get a professional to do it. Not that I'm a professional. I mean, I know what I'm doing. I have my tow license, but I haven't done it enough that I'm considered a professional, which is why I would always call you. And in particular, I would ask for Carl. So <laughs> <laughs> well, these are the same people. These are the same people who you complain about all day long. They're like, man, he's on the wrong side of the lake. He just cut me off. Look at the wave he's throwing. Next thing you know, you're throwing a rope to tow you in. Yeah, right. It doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? <laughs> right, right. There's another toe. Yeah, yeah and the, the people in the front of this one, they're just kind of hanging out, enjoying the day. <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, that was one that ran into a submerged island down. You know where that one single tree grows out of the lake down by? Right uh, from the dam. It's close. It's yeah. uh, So if you're going towards the dam and you have Marina Rowena on your left, it is three coves past Marina Rowena in about three quarters of the year. It's one single tree sticking out of the water. We call it One Tree Island. Yep. I've heard it called Palm Tree Island and One Tree. And yeah, well, there's a, at certain water levels, there's a pretty good sized shelf there that people don't know about. You can't really go around the tree. So this fella found out the hard way and ripped the outdrive off and the boat sank there on the shelf. So we went out and recovered it. And, but I couldn't, stop the water going in enough so we left it on airbags while i towed it to the dam so uh, that's an example of us towing a boat on an airbag interesting picture here so this was a a boat an, an old wood boat that was abandoned in its slip at lee's ford years ago and uh this was one january and the boat i guess had a fitting freeze and break and then thaw and the boat sank and of course, it had already been abandoned. The guy hadn't paid the slip fees. There was no insurance on it. So the marina manager at the time had me go over and look at it and tell him what I thought it would cost to recover the boat. So I go over and I took this picture. So here's the boat, right? And I thought, well, that's not too bad. It's still tied to the dock and it, it doesn't look too bad. So I gave him a price. Well, a week goes by and this is middle of January. So go to the next picture door. So when they finally approve it a week or 10 days later, I go back. This is the... This is the updated scene. The entire marina froze over. The boat ripped off the dock and sank to the bottom in 30 feet of water, and then ice froze over it. Those are the engine hatches that floated out of it. So we had to uh, we had to break ice all the way around the marina. This was on the back side. So I had to go around about a quarter mile of dock to get to it, breaking the ice the whole way with the pontoon. And then I had to take a two before and break the ice here to make a hole to get the diver in the water to go down and put the airbags on it to recover it. <laughs> but that's how much things can change in a week or 10 days, you know. I hope you requoted that. <laughs> and I, I don't even want to talk about that. Um, <laughs> yeah, we were there all day long. For the it, same price. <laughs> we, we were there all day long and it didn't get above 15 degrees the whole day. It was horrible. <laughs> well, the... Um... When you go through and you do this kind of work consistently, obviously it makes you the professional. And I think that um, hopefully people watch this video and they realize that there's a lot that goes into this. There's a lot that can happen on the water and you're responsible for your boat. If anything happens on the water, as you said, from the time you buy the boat until the time the boat is out of your name, whether it is a float or it is on the bottom of the lake, that boat is your responsibility. Um, a couple videos back a few weeks ago, I did an interview with um, Eric Fisher from Outdoor Adventure, uh, and he is a marine insurance specialist. Um, he specializes in boat insurance, um, and it wasn't like a scare tactic or anything, but when my friend's houseboat went down in that number of $1.6 million, um, and they had just had their boat pulled out of the water and had it appraised. And so they had had it reinsured for a different value, for a more up-to-date value, um, and had a lot of other like umbrella policy, things like that put on it. Had they not have done that, they would have been almost $700,000 out of pocket. And so those types of numbers, when it comes to boating, when you boat, when you boat at a lake as deep as Lake Cumberland, and you have boats out here as big as what ours are, and you are putting hundreds of gallons of gas in a boat. And if that boat goes down and that fuel leaks out, 
you are responsible for cleaning up that mess. And those types of things are not bringing the boat up, cleaning up the gas. Those things are not, ex those things are not cheap. And so from interviewing Eric and talking about the price of what it is, interviewing you and seeing what all goes into this type of thing, I hope people understand the expense that can come with that. And that they become, you know, that my whole pro reason I do these videos and that I teach these classes is to educate people on the process. I mean, some of it can be entertaining. It's, it's intriguing to see this stuff, but educating people and that they understand what they're getting themselves into when they go out on the water and the responsibilities that comes with it. And so, you know, I really appreciate you being willing to do this video with me and to, um, to show all the pictures that you did. Uh, so for that, I'm grateful. Um, I really appreciate the time that you've spent with us today. Um, you guys, Don, how can they get a hold of you and get a membership? If you want to talk about your, um, your, dot com page in your Facebook? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, we've still got an old school web page and you can actually uh, go down there and you can read all about what we do. There's examples of what we do and you can actually sign up to buy a service plan on there that covers towing on Lake Cumberland and on the Southern Basin of Lake Erie under one, pr on, on one price. Uh, it's uh, cumberlandtowboat.com is the direct link. And uh like I say, you can you can check it out. You can sign up right on there, buy a membership right on there. And then, of course, I've got a couple other pages that are uh, we, we're the hydro hoist dealer for Lake Cumberland, the boat lift dealer. Uh, so there's a, a Facebook page for that uh, called uh, Docks and Divers. You'll find that on Facebook. My Marine Assist page is very uh, popular on Facebook. It's just uh, Facebook.com slash Marine Assist. And uh, then we sell boat trailers, too. So uh, we're kind of I try to. I tried to pick a bunch of businesses that people weren't already offering here when I moved here because I didn't want to step on any toes and, you know, and it looked like it was a needed service. I mean, it's a big lake and there was nobody offering the service when I came here. And last year we ended up doing 170 calls. So, you know, it, it, it's, and that's with four tow boats. So, you know. Well, and, and something else, I meant to say this earlier, I had it written down here on my notes. A lot of people think like your insurance policy has a tow coverage. And like my insurance policy has a tow coverage as well. However, what people don't realize is that if you do have a tow and you claim that on your insurance policy, that is rateable, which means that your insurance premiums can go up and it does count as a claim. So and it knocks you out of those diminishing deductibles because it's a, it's a claim. Some of those, I don't know, I guess they're still doing those diminishing deductibles if you don't have a claim, uh, but it knocks you out of that. And, and of course, it, anything they can do to raise the rate, and I hate yeah. to, I hate Absolutely. to sound that way, but you know, and you just kind of where our plan is a totally separate thing, and it's an actual service. It's not an insurance plan; it's a service plan because you're actually paying the company that does that provides the service for the coverage for it. You're not paying a third party like you do an insurance company. You know, when you pay an insurance company or one of these big conglomerate tow companies, you're paying somebody in Washington D.C. at their head headquarters to sell you insurance to then try to find you someone to tow you when you're broken down. Uh, their hope is they don't find anybody and they don't have to pay out anything where us, you know, you pay us, it supports operations here locally and we provide the service. You're actually, the money goes directly right to the, the people that are doing the work, you know, and providing the service. So I always thought that that's a big thing, you know, that's important. Yep. And it's in your local business owner here in the, in the Lake Cumberland area. So I'm also big on, you know, shop local support the local businesses here in our area. So um, if you guys, if you have any questions or anything, you can uh, message Don directly on his Facebook page. You know that you can find myself and you can find Don on the Lake Cumberland Boaters.com Facebook page. Um, and if you can't just get on there and ask a question, what's Don's phone number? What's Dora's phone number? And I'll direct you directly to him. So Don, thank you very much for joining me to do this video. I'm Dora Miles, the Boatress with Dockside Live.